We are now. <laughs> All right, excellent. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is John Davis, and I'm supervisor of MarineDebris.info, the discussion forum on marine litter and ocean plastics produced by Octo. On this webinar, we also have Nick Weiner, Octo's Director of Open Initiatives, who is handling the webinar's technical side and co-moderating with me. So happy you can all be here today. It's gonna to be a good presentation. We have Tony Ribink, CEO of Sustainable Seas Trust, a South African NGO that promotes sustainability and poverty alleviation of coastal communities through education. He also directs the African Marine Waste Network, which aims to reduce and eventually stop the flow of waste, especially plastics, from the 38 coastal and island states of Africa into the world ocean. Tony will be speaking about the African Marine Waste Network today and how it is finding solutions to this major challenge. Uh, the way this will work is that Tony will speak for about uh, 20 minutes or so, then we'll have the rest of the time for questions. We definitely encourage questions or comments and you can submit them at any point during the webinar by clicking the Q&A button on the webinar user interface on your screen on the right side. Uh, the button that says Q&A. Uh, also, if you have any technical difficulties, you can note them as well in the questions panel or, um, I don't, Nick, would you like them to note that in the chat panel or just stick everything in questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll note that in the chat panel. Okay, uh, and we'll do our best to help you. Uh, when we get to the question and answer portion, I will moderate the questions, taking one at a time and asking the questions to Tony. So let's get started. Tony, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, John. Um, good evening from me, but I guess to most of you, it's good morning. Um, I'm based in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, where the hub for the African Marine Waste Network is located. I'm going to talk to you about the African Marine Waste Network and the issues in Africa, but one of the themes that I will have tonight, sorry, today, is that Africa's doesn't have the capacity to really deal with challenges. It has some brilliant people and some fantastic leaders, but we need far greater capacity. So I'll be also throwing open the opportunities for you to consider how you might join us. Right, um, most, much of the focus these days is on Asia. Um, we seem to have a problem with the Right, there we are. Um, so Asia is the current focus because without question, at the moment, it has the heaviest pollution load and is pouring more plastics into the ocean than any other part of the world. However, Africa is currently second worst. And if we allow matters to continue as they are, then Africa could overtake Asia. And the reason for this is that there are expectations and a large number of predictions that the population growth rate in Africa is going to accelerate and will be beyond that of any other part of the world. It's anticipated that between now and 2050, when the population is expected to be 9 billion on the planet, that Africa will add 1.3 million of those 2 million extra people. This means that Africa's population will almost double. And as you know, the more people, the more waste. Um, the other worrying aspect for Africa is that many of the people are currently under the age of 18 and there'll be 60% plus in 2050. These are quite salutary facts and the fact that Nigeria will have more people in it than USA by then I think brings home the, the message. The other aspect is that not only does Africa have the greatest population rate of urban people are moving from the rural into the large cities. That's resulting in the cities growing, and it's quite clear that rural populations, in fact, produce less plastic than in urban areas and the urban areas are becoming massive and most of them are not really well catered for in terms of waste management. So these urban 
developments are in fact expected to increase the amount of waste that is generated in the cities and most of the growth is along the coast because a handful of something along the coast is often better than very little inland. The other aspect that is also adding to the problem is that a number of countries have had considerable economic development as nations over the past few decades, several of the countries being well over 7%. Increase in the, the, the wealth of the countries and the growth of the middle class has of course resulted in an increase in plastic, plastic use, plastic waste, plastic production. But for the poorer people, and many of them, there hasn't been a noticeable change in the poverty levels. And so these two issues, or these three issues, all add to an expert. The art in Africa is going to be extremely high over the next couple of decades if we allow matters to continue as they are. So we really need to, in fact, be thinking of the future, we need to do today what would in fact stop having a major effect in the future. The problem with economic development is that if it goes ahead unplanned, and this applies to plastics and other things, then we will find ourselves in a very serious situation which will affect and compromise the economies of Africa. That is a slight side issue, but it does reflect on plastic and tourism and this sort of thing as well, because we need to plan for a larger population along the coasts, and we need to plan in terms of the way in which we develop the countries and the cities, as well as catering for plastic as well. With these issues being so prevalent and such a concern, with plastic having simply accumulated since the 1950s, in some coastal towns without any, any endeavor at all to manage them, there is a need then for a way in which we can bring the countries together, bring the people within countries together. So the African Marine Waste Network was developed last year, and then it's been growing for the course of this last year as well for the last 12 months or so. The, as John pointed out, our responsibility is to serve as best we can the 38 coastal and island states of Africa to promote collaboration across all sectors within countries and then collaboration across borders. And we need to find collective solutions, which is beginning to go quite well. Now, the hub for the network is in fact in South Africa, and that makes some good sense too because the Nairobi Convention, which is essentially the 10 countries on the east side of the African continent and includes the islands of Madagascar and Comores, Seychelles, Mauritius and so forth, th those are then members on the east side. And then on the west side we've got the Abidjan Convention, which is essentially 22 countries along the west coast of Africa. Af South Africa, which has an east and a west coast, then serves both of those. One of the issues that we need to do in South Africa is to develop proof of concept in our country, but we hope we plan to do that by bringing people from other countries down to work with us so that they are better able to go home and practice what they have learned. To get a good idea of what we should do and where we should go, we held in July this year, the African Marine Waste Conference to which we invited people from around the world to provide guidance. And of course, we had experts come on from Africa as well to join us. We had excellent speakers, as can be seen here with Sylvia Earle on, on the left at the top, and Jenna Jambek and Tessa Friend in, in the bottom, and Taba in the right-hand side at the top. But the real focus of this conference was on discussions and, and um, little workshops and then a major workshop where everyone was asked where are we now in certain disciplines where do we need to be and how are we going to get there and this then gave us the pointers as to where we should take africa in the future <clears throat> and it became absolutely clear as has already been mentioned that the major areas of concern would obviously be the municipal areas where people live in fairly high densities 
And as most of these municipalities and these areas of high density are on rivers and in catchments, every, every municipality has to be in a catchment or even more than one catchment, it meant that we're looking at a system of where do the people live and what happens to the plastic and that tends to go either because it's wind blown or because of wash from rains and so forth into these tributaries and into the rivers and into the estuaries and ultimately out to sea. So the focus then needs to be on the highly densely populated areas and on the rivers and the estuaries and the rest of the catchment. Stopping the plastic as best we can. As problems we face in that it is data poor. Most of the knowledge that we have is from surrogate data rather than direct measurement. The surrogate data being based on number of people, the poverty levels, the wealth levels, uh, etc. So working at a continental scale to get a handle on where we really are, we were asked to sort of leapfrog the types of approach that we took and to in fact look at new technologies. And so what we're planning to do is to, as I mentioned, focus on municipalities, catchments and rivers, but in doing so to use satellites and drones to get a very good idea of what is happening within these, but of course to ground truth using mobile apps and actual surveys within these rivers and within the catchments and the sources of, of pollution. <clears throat> we the Swartkorps catchment for the proof of concept and this is a catchment which is quite close to us and you can see from this illustration that there are affluent areas and more importantly there are the impoverished areas. We feel that we can in the affluent areas follow the way in which Europe and the States and Canada work and persuade people there to separate at source to play a really good role and to assist with the recycling and the management of plastic. In the impoverished areas there needs to be an incentive for people to pick up the plastics. They happen to live amongst plastics and other forms of waste and they're just unserviced areas and therefore it really is dependent upon them until we can get services into those areas. And so these are the areas in which we need to look at incentive schemes, etc. And there are a variety of those. The Swartkorps estuary is well within this catchment and it is highly polluted. It used to be a tourism area and with, with river miles being swum and other aquatic activities, this is no longer the case. And so it's an excellent place for us to conduct these surveys and for education. It's also manageable. It's small enough to be manageable, but it's big enough to develop a proof of concept. And the illustration that you see now shows that in addition to the urban areas and the municipalities, it also has conservation areas and agricultural areas. So the ability for us to compare is really great. It's also very close to the university, the Nelson Mandela University, which in fact has just recently opened its ocean sciences campus and is probably going to become the leading maritime university on the African continent. The hub of the African Marine Race Network is also in Port Elizabeth. We have a supportive municipality and the biology, the hydrographics, topography and so forth of this river catchment is well studied. So there's a basis for going forwards. It flows into, the water flows into the bay in Africa, which is the best recorded. There are over 200 recording systems within this bay. And so what happens when the waters flow into the airstream and they flow out of the airstream, what happens to the, to the plastic waste can actually be monitored much more readily because they're already a whole variety of instruments in the bay. So these reasons encourage us to use the SWAT Corps as, a cat, as the proof of concept area. This photograph gives you an idea of the pollution that takes place in the informal settlements 
where we need to, in fact, provide benefits of economic value to the people who live there. Right, we plan to develop a baseline and then on the 15th of September this coming year, that's 2018, when the ICC holds its massive cleanup and the Let's Do It World does the same thing, we would like to mobilize the media, industry, local government, schools, university, indeed everybody, to help us with a massive cleanup and to then do a, develop a new clean baseline. Now, to keep the area clean is going to re rely on us having a very, very good education program and awareness as mentioned in service. Uh -oh. John, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I think we uh, lost Tony. I think we lost Tony. Uh, um, I oh, think he's back. I can hear you now. Ah. Um, how do I get back in? Uh, you should be able to share your screen again at the bottom. Okay. Are we? We're still recording. You're still, you're still, uh, if you're able to share your screen, we can. Yes, um, can you not see the screen? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Sorry about this. Oh, no, it's not your fault. I think the connection just got garbled there at the end. Um. Right, it's not giving me the options to share the screen. If you hover your cursor over your over Zoom, does a green share screen button show up at the bottom? Not at the moment. Um, let's see. I'm going to try to come back in from this start. Would that right. make sense? Uh, yeah, it's probably not a bad idea if you're not getting the button. All right, everyone in the audience, please bear with us. Obviously, we're having some technical difficulties here. We're trying to correct them as quickly as we can. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions uh, based on what Tony has said already, uh, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box, uh, which should be in your control panel part of, of the Zoom interface. So over to the right-hand side and click the Q&A button. And that should uh, allow you to, to type in uh, any questions that you may have. And once Tony is done with his presentation, we'll switch into uh, uh, the Q&A um, portion of the webinar. Right, are we back? Yep. Okay. Apologies, is it, are we back on track now? Yeah, yeah, we are. all set. Nice work. Okay, uh, um, I don't know if this was our side or your side, but anyway, you are back, so that's great. <laughs> Mind for capacity building is what we call the African Waste Academy. It's in italics there because it's not necessarily the formal name, but the concept is that we would have a multi-institutional, multinational, fairly loose type of association in which any of you who are listening could in fact offer courses, come and help with the research, and ultimately we would develop a really powerful course 
with guidance from people such as yourselves. And this would be also using people come down to or such as yourselves, go and give talks and lectures in other parts of Africa as well. The purpose, though, is to help build the capacity. We are often told that is that the onset plus education, and there's no doubt that there's merit. We discuss so little of Jews that would to help us of materials and that also includes educators in it many about rubbish so these are really important issues capacity we need to not teach us we need to provide the curriculum so forth to go out into to do and there's that in Africa at the moment, there isn't a single university that runs a comprehensive degree course on marine waste. So that is another path, path that we need to follow. <clears throat> the central role of this network, the African Marine Waste Network, is to network, and we've started already in many ways. And again, it's going to be important to have people such as yourselves contribute to what we do. Holding the conference, of course, was one way of networking and we've had, held a number of workshops as well. But online networking and other activities are going to be high priorities in certainly getting people to coordinate activities. <clears throat> we see that the opportunities to participate either as a volunteer or as a funded contributor coming to Africa, volunteering from where you are, activities and ideas, or coming as a researcher and to work with counterparts, hopefully funded. And I list here a very broad spectrum of activities in which we would like to involve people, particularly if we can learn from your expertise in, in Africa. Um, this could be, of course, a whole lot bigger, but every aspect that involves the plastic issue needs to be looked at and we need to get the better understanding and the information and knowledge which can guide decisions so again my call is well if you've got ideas and you think you can either send your students or come out yourselves that would be wonderful to have you here one of the exciting aspects is that we've got this the first yacht but there are a variety of other yachts that are indicating or the owners are indicating that they would join us and the idea is to have them move up and down the coasts of initially southern and eastern Africa, including planned trips to Madagascar, and we run research and education programs. And this is also being opened to people such as yourselves, so that you could A, let us know what type of research we might be able to do, and B, perhaps join us on these cruises. And where it's not on the screws, quite often it will be part of a land-based party moving along from town to town. So we have some fun ahead of us. I believe that we've got momentum. We have direction now. There's an urgency and there are many fields for collaboration in science, the social sciences, and to make, and, and together we could make a significant difference um, by meeting the challenges. And I believe also that the future is looking a lot greater and better. To indicate that those that we have brought together, there's a mixture of from business, from universities, from action, indeed, for your patience, and sorry about that glitch in the middle. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, and and uh, you you handled the glitch uh, with with a plum. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, great job on that, and very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm John Davis, Marine Debris.info Supervisor. Uh, we now open up the webinar to audience Q and A for the next uh, uh, half hour or so. If audience members have a question for Tony, uh, you can submit it by clicking the Q&A button that's on the control panel on your screen, and we will, or the webinar control panel, and we will be drawing from those questions throughout this Q&A session. Uh, and we already have a few lined up. Uh, so first one is from Monica. 
Uh, how does the plastic waste problem affect the private sector uh, in African nations? And how can this be used to involve the private sector in solutions? Monica, um, I think to some extent, it's, uh, I'm not sure where Monica comes from, but um, assuming you're from the USA, um, Monica, the private sector is handling it in the well-developed parts of Africa in much the same way as it would in um, the US or within Europe or Canada or elsewhere. Um, the private sector, though, is also, in fact, making positive contributions to working in the areas in which, which are totally unserviced and doing, I think, a really great job. So as part of their corporate social responsibility issues, so we, and I, I think that um, I've understood you correctly, we, they are involved in recycling, they are involved in um, utilizing plastic streams for development of, of materials and furniture and, all, and buildings and all sorts of things. So they are involved, they're playing their role, and often they play a bigger role in terms of what's happening than the governments, they seem to become more involved in the education programs and support and, and so forth. So I think that the private sector is playing a role. There is a greater need though, because we do need to develop economic enterprises in the unserviced areas where people are generally poor, because unless there is, unless it is worthwhile for people to pick up the waste, to clean the waste, they're not going to do it. So that is an open field in which we'd love to have people come and give ideas. There are buyback centers and other sorts of things which are not uncommon elsewhere, but I think the areas and, and the extent of it is much more acute in Africa. I hope that's answered Monica's question. That's great, thanks, Tony. Uh, we have a question from Joel, uh, who represents the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, uh, con which is concerned with solving the problem of lost and abandoned fishing gear, or ghost gear, uh, worldwide. Is lost fishing gear, most of which is plastic, a concern for the African Marine Waste Network? And would there be any interest in collaborating with the uh, GGGI in some way? The answer to that is yes, it is a concern. It's also relatively under, understudied. There's very little done by in terms of education. There's very little research. It's, to me, one of the areas which has been largely overlooked in Africa, and yet it is, um, I, I believe, a much bigger issue than most other people seem to think. So the answer in terms of collaboration, very, very welcome. That That is a hole that needs to be filled. Um, and in the conference that I went to last week, it wasn't in Nairobi, um, this was actually a major issue that we do need to do something about it in Africa. So yes, please, if collaboration is a possibility, we are very interested. That's great, thanks, Tony. And how would you recommend that people get in touch with you to, um, to address potential collaborations? Yes, I, um, sorry about that. I should have put this on, on the board, but it's um, info, at sst.org.za, you'll get to me. Okay. So and again, everybody. My, only, my own email is a.ribbink at sst.org.za. Okay. Apologies, that should have been, been on, on, on the screen. Uh, no worries. Thanks. Thanks for that, Tony. And we can, we can uh, repeat that at, at the end of the webinar as well. Uh, Thank we you. Have, uh, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, we have a question from Wynne. Uh, who, who do we get in touch with to collaborate on research? Uh, where can I find out more about the research that you are already doing? Um, again, that would be with us. Um, it depends on the nature of the research, but being the hub and, and being part of a network, if we're not directly involved with it ourselves, we can direct whoever is interested to those universities and those groups who are working on it. Of course, if that research is not being done anywhere in Africa, and or we don't know about it, well then that would need to be followed up and investigated or possibly initiated. But certainly one of our roles as a network hub is to put people in touch with one another, and this is one of the things that we could do. 
in fact, should do. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, it's great to see uh, linkages already happening as a result of this this presentation. Yes, uh, I'm excited by it. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a note from Nina uh, that she'd like to share a concept for education, including establishment of school waste banks, so, uh, which would, uh, in other words, manage the waste stream and provide an incentive for the community. Uh, she'd also like to highlight the connection, um, the connection of ocean action and climate action. So there, there are a number of things there and we can take them one at a time if you'd like. Right. Um, there are projects on the go, like, like Clean Spot, where schools are encouraged to clean up their own school environment. And then, because that's not going to be um, sufficient in terms of volume of waste, then persuade the communities in which they live and those in industry to also help them. And they then get reimbursed from either collectors or recyclers and so forth and they're taught how to utilize or how they, they're taught how to handle the cash some of it's invested others is dispersed they audited and so forth this is a project that is rather like nina's and i think that we should do everything that we can to share ideas on this and then roll out the very best that we can because clearly if in these unserviced rather poor areas if we can change the way in which the children are thinking and also of course this has to be preceded by training the teachers and get them to recognize that waste is not necessarily waste but is an economic resource we will be well on the way to solving the problem so i would love to hear the details of nina's work and to work with her to develop something that is better suited to africa a lot of the projects and education programs that we have received now i'd love to get people to contribute modules for education etc but we find that sometimes they're not suitable for the cultures and circumstances of africa and so we need to adapt them but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be sent we, we'd love to, to hear from people so yes nina we'd like to support you what was the next question uh, the next question was uh, asking about the connection between ocean action and climate action and whether the uh, African Marine Waste Network is tying into concerns about, uh, about climate change as part of its work to address plastic waste. Yeah, I think um, not directly, but I do find it's very interesting that our polluted world, of course, it has, has affected absolutely everything. Pollution is responsible for climate change and for global warming and for our plastic crisis. And so it's all, all man-made. Um, so we're not necessarily doing anything directly related to climate change at the moment. We're just trying to get the basics going. But it's a very good point, and I think that possibly we should pay more attention to it than we have been doing. Um, we, we are working quite hard, so we've only been going for a year, and uh, climate change is quite a big thing. At our launch, and it was actually on to our local television, somebody said that we should actually be working on all forms of pollution, because in Africa, pollution is the second and third greatest killer. Um, but they argued that the network should be involved in all of this because as a network if you're serving the plastic issue you should also serve the others so possibly we should look more closely at what nina suggests and incorporate more on climate change into the network and the information we're sending out uh, just a little overwhelming at the moment <laughs> uh, understandable thanks tony uh one of the the dreams um maybe eventual realities in the in the marine litter uh, sector has been the concept of having uh, conversion facilities at river mouths uh, in parts of the world where uh, uh, ocean plastic or uh, waste plastic inputs are are most severe uh, that would convert that waste plastic that's connected at river mouths into fuel. Uh, are you are you looking at that at all and some of the newer um, versions of, of such technologies coming out or does that seem uh, too far in the future for you to be uh, very concerned with? Well, you've touched on two, I think, 
important issues. The one is the river mouths are incredibly important in terms of us assessing the amount of plastic that is going into the oceans. They will also, in fact, be a measure of how successful we are in stopping plastic at source, because if we can reduce the flow from the catchment into these rivers and into basically what they are the conduits, and we have that sort of measure, that is really good. Um, <clears throat> South Africa, where we are based, has a very high energy coast. So those sorts of capture systems are quite difficult to implement. And we also have a fairly good tidal range. So the inflow and outflow are, again, uh, dominated by fairly high energy. In other parts of Africa, it, the tidal flow and the energy is, is less, so that might be more accessible and easier to catch there. With regard to conversions of plastics into fuel, that has been attempted several times in Africa, but not with great success. And it's also in fact quite costly in terms of the energy to drive those systems. So we're not there yet. Um, it's also not my field, but we're open to any suggestion and to also put things on the network. As I said earlier, our role as a network is to also inform people of activities and, and possibilities. So if whoever made the suggestion would like to pass it on to me, it was you, John. Um, it was so I. You'd like to, <laughs> yeah. If you'd like to give me more information on that to explore, I can put it out uh, to the, the different organizations with whom we work and find out what the, the feedback is. But I personally am out of my depth with regard to that. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we have uh, an anonymous question asker. Uh, what types of national strategies or policies, if any, are underway for marine litter uh, on the continent uh, or in the regional sea conventions? And how uh, is the African Marine Waste Network working with those efforts? Right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Firstly, some of the countries of Africa have got superb policies, um, but are unable for various reasons to implement them. And others, in fact, don't have very much by way of policies, but all, in fact, are affected by international approaches. With regard to policies, uh, we need to define the role of the network. The network doesn't have a mandate to be able to dictate or to instruct anybody on, on anything. We can't even tell a small organization what they should do, let alone a government or a region. What we can do, though, is to develop strategies and to develop um, recommendations and guides to best practice, guides to action. And if those happen to in fact include recommendations regarding policies, then it's up to the country or a region, which sometimes several countries combine to be part of a region like SADAC and so forth. They, they then are at liberty to adopt them. If what we suggest does have real appeal to, for example, the Abidjan and Nairobi Convention, then they can, in fact, ask their countries to implement a recommendation. And the same might be to the African Union. But our role, the African Marine Based Network's role, is to give ideas on the guides to best actions or best practices, and that applies also to policy. I think that virtually every African country um, has signed up to some international agreements, not, not necessarily the same. So th there's in fact a good movement and Africa was well represented in Nairobi last week. Unfortunately, I wasn't there, but um, and a number of African countries, in fact, the majority were there, are signatories to the latest UNIA um, resolution. So yes, so, so that, that, that I thought was a good meeting, although I haven't had time to study it very carefully, but skimming what happened is, is, is encouraging. Thanks for that, Tony. Thanks for bringing up the, the UN Environment Assembly resolution. That was, uh, it, was, it was exciting to see that step forward last week. Um, are there any other groups or NGOs uh, working on the issue of marine debris and plastics in Africa? And uh, what role do you think is needed from civil society and policymakers? Uh, what do you see as the barriers to overcome to, to get to where you want to 
to where you want to be on this issue? That seems like three questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. but the, the first question is, are there any other NGOs? And the answer to that is yes, there are many. Um, some are doing splendid jobs. Some intend to do splendid jobs that are enthusiastic need, and need a little help. Um, and the NGOs actually, I think like in many parts of the world, the NGOs are a very good interface between the officialdom of, of, of governments and the academia of universities and, and the public. So these NGOs, I think, are absolutely critically important in their role. Um, and I think, I, I at the moment don't know, I haven't done a full survey, but I think that there are probably NGOs in every, of the, every one of the 38 um, coastal and island countries with whom we are dealing. Um, one of my colleagues might be able to give the exact numbers, but yeah, so the NGOs are playing an important role and in some cases doing it splendidly and in other cases getting there. What is the second part of that question? Uh, well, the, the, technically the second part was what role do you think is needed from civil society and policymakers? And the third part was what do you see as the main barriers to overcome to uh, reaching your goals? Yeah. Well, civil society and policymakers are often very different. Um, in fact, normally are. So civil society, which are principally consumers and voters, can definitely inf influence policymakers. So the better informed they are, the stronger they are in terms of their voice if a government is not in fact doing what it should. On the other hand, um, government can also implement some of its policies through civil society by influencing them. So there is a good link between civil society and policy in many, but not all African countries. And barriers, which, which barriers in specific, specifically did, were that we mentioned? Were there a specific barrier or just barriers in general? Barriers in general. What are the main barriers that, that you see to, uh, facing you going forward? I, I think the main barrier is lack of capacity um, and therefore the need for education. The, uh, and that, that, that capacity is not just education. We've indicated that the municipalities and the areas where people live in great numbers are very poorly managed. And the problem is that these municipalities do not have the capacity. They do not have the capacity in terms of necessarily understanding. Now, I'm, that's a generalization. There are some absolutely marvelous people working in some municipalities doing splendid jobs. But if you're looking at the continent as a whole, then the municipalities need a great deal of help. They need the infrastructure. They need to understand what they're doing. They need to, in fact, be planning ahead because at the moment they haven't caught up with where we are now, let alone looking ahead as to where they need to be. They don't have the financial capacity either. So a really, really big barrier to success is to build the capacity within municipalities to deal with the issues. There's some very willing municipalities that would love to be doing the right thing, but are just unable to do so. So to me, that, that capacity is a major problem. But the capacity in general and, and the understanding of the public, there are many, many people even in senior positions who don't recognize that waste in Africa is actually a problem. Maybe this has changed since Kenya banned the bag and that sort of thing. But there are people in senior government positions who have grown up with waste around them and all sorts of forms of pollution. And in a way, they, they're then blind to the problem. They don't recognize it as a problem because this has always been there. And so, again, the need to educate, the need to get out to teachers, the need to get into schools, the need to get to civil society is enormous. And we believe that this is a very, very important role of the network. Those are excellent points. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and thank you to the audience. Please keep your, your questions coming in. Click the Q&A button if you have any more questions. We still have a few in the queue, but it's, it's getting shorter. Um, I'll keep pulling from them. A question from Joel. Has there been any interest in plastic pollution in lakes, uh, such as Lake Victoria, or is it currently focused uh, just on rivers and oceans? Um, yes. <clears throat> 
at our conference, we had people from Lake Malawi, or if you, from Mozambique or Tanzania, Lake Nyasa, and they represented the African Great Lakes. And the argument also was that the African Marine Race Network shouldn't simply be focusing on the current marine environment. They should recognize that the lakes are also inland lakes and that what happens inland in, locked, in landlocked countries ultimately makes its way down to the marine environment. So the call was for us to actually deal with all African countries. Um, so I guess the answer to that question is yes, they should be viewed as um, inland seas. They should be taken seriously. In some respects, they are a little bit more vulnerable because the outlets of the African Great Lakes are very small relative to their area and volume. And it's, uh, yeah, so, so the answer is yes, we have to pay more attention to the lakes. A very good question. I, I, I think that she's put your finger on an issue that certainly needs more attention. That's great, thank you. Uh, and one question here on research, uh, asking you to highlight uh, some of the research that's currently being done in Africa on marine debris and ocean plastics and river plastics, and uh, what kinds of research uh, need to be done. Uh, perhaps um, uh, what research has been underdone so far and should be focused on more. Right. Um quite difficult to do an assessment for the whole of Africa because it's very patchy and a, a lot depends upon who's really joined the network. Given that the data from Africa is so poor, it's, it's quite difficult to do this. That's something we're building up on. Um, locally in Southern Africa and, and part of Eastern Africa and also Western Africa, microplastics seem to have become exceedingly fashionable in terms of all research. The, the um, what's actually happening to microplastics in terms of from origin to the, the sea, from source to sea, um, hasn't been as well studied as it should be. The type, of the type of research that seems to dominate is an endeavor to find out how much waste is being generated by different cities, what's going to landfill, what's not going to landfill, though those sort of statistics are coming out quite well in some places. I would say that as with capacity, the research is lagging behind and is a long way behind where it should be. And therefore the information for decisions and that are based on, you know, the, the decisions that are based on, on good information, it's just not there. So a great deal more research is required. We don't actually even know in terms of measurable um, data how much waste is being produced by each country, which was one of the calls by the Norwegian delegates at Namias, that every country needs to find out how much waste it's producing and how much is going into the sea. I would say with considerable confidence that there's probably not a single country in Africa that would be able to give this with any degree of real accuracy, maybe within possibly 10%. So the field for research is open. I uh, indicated in that list of research topics and, and fields for collaboration that even research into anthropology and demographics and so forth, um, the socioeconomic state, those are all important fields. So it's really wide open. Now, having said that, there are also some outstanding researchers who've done very good research in Africa, but they are very far apart and very few. Thanks, Tony. Um, we're, we're at the end of our Q&A queue. Um, I, I have a couple, uh, couple questions on my mind. Uh, other regional uh, marine waste networks, uh, which ones have you seen to this point? Uh, and what would be your plans on coordinating with them? Or what would there be value in such international um, inter-regional coordination? Um, yes, the, the, absolutely. Africa, uh, you know, what flows from the African shores goes ultimately to the shores of 
other countries of the world as well, if it doesn't go into the into the gyres. And equally, what comes from other parts of the world that ends up on the African shores means that we're all part of a global problem, and therefore the networking becomes absolutely vital. So yes, there are some. I think Nina, if it's the right Nina, Nina is from the Indonesian network. We've also been linking with Portuguese networks and others. And th there are many, and I think it's absolutely essential that these networks, in fact, talk to each other. And we see ourselves as being part of the global network. We have to provide an African perspective in the um, global networks that exist. And that there are several. And for some, uh, possibly senility, uh, I'm not remembering their names now, even though I deal with them daily. Um, so this is something that we're all in together and the more networking we can do, the better. The more ideas we share, the more examples we give, it's an absolute imperative. That's great. I think that's a nice place to, to leave it. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and uh, for anyone in the audience who would like to get in touch with Tony uh, to share ideas, connect with him on potential collaborations or other information, uh, his email is in the chat box on screen. It is a for Anthony dot ribbink, R-I-B-B-I-N-K at S-S-T dot org dot Z-A or Z-A for South Africa. Um, so uh, we conclude this webinar now. We received uh, a lot of questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, and on behalf of MarineDebris.info, uh, I want to thank Tony Ribbink for contributing your insights. This was very interesting. I applaud your work. You have a lot of work ahead of you. Um, but, um, uh, but I look forward to having you back in coming years to see what trends and lessons and hopefully successes uh, you've seen. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to all of those who were in the audience and who asked, I thought, very good questions. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks again, Tony. And thank you to the audience. And have a good day, everyone. Uh, John, you can end the meeting in the bottom right corner. Right. Should I edit? Um, Nick, thank you very much indeed. I hope that.